Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, I sure am glad to be here with you in Edward's place this morning. I know you're praying for him to get to go back to a church where he served before. Uh, I have spent the last uh, few decades of my life in an academic setting, a university setting, and it has been uh, somewhat uh, distressing for me to see um, the secularization of American culture. I think the last uh, survey I saw was that 27% of millennials are atheists. Uh, we know from statistics that uh, Young people who grow up in church and go off to secular universities that 85% of them never return to church. That we have not prepared ourselves or our young people to face a militant, atheistic agenda. And I'm uh, really getting tired of being patted on the head saying, well, you're a nice guy and, you know, just go believe your folklore over in the corner. I ain't going to the corner, fool. There is as much evidence for Christianity as any other system. People, people amaze me, say, oh, we just believe in science and facts. You are ignorant if you think science has facts. You can't imagine how many presuppositions are caught up in modern scientific theory. And they change totally every 50 years. And you're going to put your hope in a scientific theory that changes? I want to tell you about a word that doesn't change. Now, what I'd like to do is, people always say to me, well, the, the Bible's just one of many holy books. I mean, how do you know your book is uh, special? Okay, I want to I challenge you a little bit, because <laughs> I'm going home. Um, <laughs> if I ask you to write down on a three-by-five card, why do you believe the Bible is unique, revelatory, and trustworthy? No, 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 no. If I, you say it is, you say it's God's special revelation to you, you say it's eternal. Now, I want to ask you, why do you believe that? Don't you think there's other people that believe the Bahadgavita or the Rig Veda or the Quran has the same spiritual power that your book does? Why is your book special? Because your mother gave you one? Because you got a white one at your wedding? Come on, why is the Bible special and unique? Why should we spend time in a modern world dealing with things that happened 2,000 plus years ago? Why do we base our moral, ethical guidelines on a book like this? Why, 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 why? Now to say we've just always done it, it's not going to cut it. It's just not going to cut it. And that's why our young people, when they hear other world views, are challenged to the point that they're willing to give up what they've always heard. Now, I believe there are at least four empirical evidences for the uniqueness and trustworthiness of the Bible. Now, I can't put the Bible in a test tube because, see, it's not that kind of evidence. But there is evidence that is demonstrable. And I think what we really want in dealing with people who either don't believe the Bible or believe it's just one of many books. What we're trying to do is open a crack in their reasoning for the Holy Spirit to speak to their heart. Because we don't win this fight by arguments. We're not trying to win an academic battle. We're trying to change hearts one at a time. Amen? And this, only the Spirit can do that. 
But I think we need to be informed enough. And I, I want to tell you, I think part of the problem is the shallowness of American Christianity. That for us, it's where we park our car one hour a week and that's what it's all about. I assure you that's not what it's all about. And people are looking for not only the kind of evidence I'm going to give to you from an academic background, they're looking for a changed life in you. And if they don't see a change in you, why would they listen to anybody else? Somebody said, the only Bible some people will ever read is you. So I want to I give you this uh, academic background for why I think the Bible is unique and trustworthy. But all the time, I hope I'm saying to your heart, I want to prepare you so that you'll be able to give a word to a secular, growingly atheistic, growing anti-Christian community in which we live. Now, it may, we may be protected in Texas for a while, but as everybody leaves uh, California and New York for the taxes, it's going to make this place different. And we need to be ready to make this place different again by helping them find Christ. Now, you know, y'all are a non-denominational church. I am not into denominations. I'm into Jesus. Amen. I don't care if we agree about Genesis or Revelation. I don't care if we agree fully about the Holy Spirit. I want you to know Jesus. You know him, you'll be with me. You don't know him, you won't be with me. Oh, I'm over it now. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, you may want to write this down. I hope you brought your Bibles. It is church, right? I want you to find uh, Micah chapter 5. <laughs> That's the part of your Bible that still has the gold on the pages. <laughs> if you turn to Psalms and turn right, you'll find it eventually. But um, Now, here's what I'm going to do. The first most powerful evidence, I think, for a supernatural, unique Bible is predictive prophecy. There is no other holy book in the world that has predictive prophecy. There is one minor prediction in the Quran, but it's, it's within the life of the prophet himself. It's only a 10-year prophecy, and it was something that everybody expected to happen. It was a, the outcome of a battle between the Parthians and the Romans. It's mentioned once, and it happened in his lifetime, and it was expected. So I'm discounting that, and that is the only example in the Quran. I am not talking now about apocalyptic passages. I mean, there are, some, there are some pretty apocalyptic prophecies. I'll give you an example. You know, Jesus came in to Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. He is betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That's, that's Zechariah 9. Now, friends, there are many other things in Zechariah 9 that did not happen in the life of Jesus. It's only when this happened in the life of Jesus did people say, you know, I heard that somewhere. We call this a typology. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about are there predictions in the Bible that are fulfilled in the Bible? Historical, justifiable predictions. And there are many. I want to pick one. And that's this Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Now Micah 5, you know Micah and Isaiah are contemporary uh, prophets about 750 B.C. People say, well, I don't believe Micah wrote at 750 B.C. Okay, okay, you, you big questioning weenie. <laughs> it's translated into Greek about at least 150, maybe 250 B.C. So if you don't believe 750, you've got to believe 150. That's still 150 years after the event when something unexpected was predicted in detail. Now, the prediction is the birthplace of the Messiah. Now, the Jews knew this. Remember when um, the wise men came and Herod the Great wanted to know where the Messiah was to be born? And the priest immediately went to this text. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, it says Bethlehem Ephrathah. There are two Bethlehems. There's one up in the north and there's one in the south. So the Ephrathah means the Bethlehem where Jesus was born, the one in the south, close to the city of Jerusalem. Bethlehem was so small... You know, I live in Karnak, Texas. We don't even have a four-way stop. Okay, that's what Bethlehem was. Its only claim to fame was that's where King David was born. It was so small, they did not draft Israeli soldiers into the army because there wasn't enough young men to keep the agriculture going. This is a really small, insignificant place. Everybody thought the Messiah would be born in Jerusalem. But no. And I, by the way, 
Do you think it was easy for Mary to get to Bethlehem? What did Jesus do? Kick prenatally south? I mean, come on. And all, all of this happened by the edict of a Roman emperor. God is in control of time, space, history for a redemptive purpose. 750 years before the birth of Jesus, God, to help us and people like us around the world in our day, know that he is in control of time and space and history. Now, God knows 750 years before the birth of Messiah, he knows what you're going through. He knows what your life is like. And he is prepared not only for his son to come, but he is prepared to love you and walk with you and deal with the things that you face. So I think predictive prophecy is absolutely astonishing. And what I, what I try to do when I deal with people say, well, I don't believe the Bible. I, I just ask them, have you ever read it? Now, of course, that's embarrassing because most Christians have never read it. I mean, how do you know it's not true if you never read it? You, you say, well, have you ever read the Quran? Yes, and I wish you'd read the Quran too. Because if you read the Quran, you'd be thrilled to death with the Bible. You talk about a series of absolutely unrelated, poetic, gobbledygook. You read the Quran and tell me what you think. Holy spit. <laughs> a reason Christians don't know about their Bible is they're watching too much TV and never read their own Bible. Now, this, if this book is from God and this book is unique, and you say this book is the guide for your life. How do you rationalize spending no time in it? Amen. Predictive prophecy. Um, I'm intended to go through some more, but I think I'll spend more time on the second one. In the last 150 years, there's become an academic discipline called archaeology. At first, it was just steal a pot and how much can you sell it for? I mean, it was just, it was really loose. But it's become much more structured, much more organized, much more fact-based as far as historical process of how do you find the things, where do you find them, and document all that. There has never been an archaeological find that has overthrown the historicity of the Bible. Now, in the face of liberalism saying the Bible is a series of myths, a series of folklore, a series of just made up things by ancient people to ex try to explain why God did something. Now friends, the problem is that's not reality. But we hear that so often. You tell a lie often enough, you tend to think it's true. Yes? It's just not. So I want to go over about three or four archaeological discoveries that I think give clear credence to the historicity of the Bible. And I want to tell you, if the Bible is not historically true, the Bible is not trustworthy. Because Christianity, as Judaism, as Islam, is a historical-based faith. Now, these Eastern religions are much more philosophical, much more um, uh, vision-oriented. They have nothing to do with history. But the three main monotheistic faiths are absolutely tied to historical relevance. Okay, number one. In Genesis 11, we start mentioning the name of Abraham's family, Terah. Uh, Nahor. Now, you know that names are characteristic of a period and a geographical region. I uh, was interim pastor a long time in Louisiana, and years ago, Beauregard was a very common name in Louisiana. Do you think anybody is named Beauregard in Louisiana today? <laughs> um, my wife's Peggy. I'm Bob. No one's named Bob and Peggy today. And it was a period, you know, it's gone. Names, these are not the same people in the Bible, but it's the same names that we now know appear in the Nuzi tablets of the 2000 B.C. period in northern Syria, which is the Tigris Euphrates, Ur of the Chaldees. So you mean the name Nahor and Terah were common names in that part of the world in the exact time when the Bible says those people lived? Yes. Did you know that the word Hittite only occurs in the Bible? Then you say, wait a minute. I, I, I've, I've heard on National Geographic about the Hittite Empire. Yes. There are three groups of Hittites in the Bible. One is this, we would call it modern Turkey, an empire, very powerful empire, that was part of Hittites as one of the Canaanite tribes in the land of Canaan. 
But if it never appears in anywhere in the Bible, if you want to disbelieve the Bible, you start saying, well, the Bible just made them up. 1947, archaeological team in central Turkey found the Royal Cuneiform Library of the Hittite Empire, 2,000 cuneiform tablets. And now we know the empire goes by two names, Anatolia and Hittite. They're both in the tablets. So suddenly the Bible chose one that was not well known but chose an accurate name. And now the historicity of the Bible is confirmed again and again. And this, this happens over and over and over. You mean I have a book that I can really trust the historical details? It's exactly what I'm saying to you. I don't, know, I don't know how many examples I could bring. Just one after another of how the more we know of ancient history, the more the Bible fits into that understanding of the world. Friends, we got a book that can predict the future and we got a book that fits in historically with exactly who and what did something in past time. The third one is, and I think this is as important as the others. You know, the Bible's written over a period of about 1,600 years. The reason I have a little doubt about that, I'm not sure of the date of the Exodus. Don't get nervous. I'm sure there was an Exodus. I'm just not sure what Pharaoh it was under, okay? So it's either 1400 or 1600. Let's take the long one. 1600 years. It's written in three languages, right? Hebrew, Royal Aramaic, and Street Greek, Koine Greek. It's written by people from kings and, 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 and prophets at court and high priests to itinerant fruit pickers, Amos. And it's one storyline, one plot, does not contradict itself. There is a unity of message over all this time, all this language, all these different countries, all these different kinds of people, and it's one unified message. Man, we couldn't go out in the street and get unanimity on a mo one modern question. And here is, a, here is an ancient book that has unanimity over all those, all those times and places and people about who God is, what he wants to do, and who he sent to do it. The fourth one I think is powerful too. And I was thinking when I come up here, you know, Bob, these people don't know you. Uh, why, why should they buy into what you're saying? Well, you gave them some evidence. You gave them something to think about. But they don't know where your life was going. And your mother told you about Jesus. And in times of real crisis, you trusted him. And things have never been the same for 60 years. <laughs> Something happened to me. I met somebody who I can't see, touch, smell, or feel. But something happened to me. And I have never been able to be the same again. And that's happened wherever this book has been read. Not taught, not preached, not studied. Wherever this book has been read, people's lives have been radically, permanently changed. Not a week of camp, not a moment of excitement, radically, permanently, morally changed. The worldview has changed. Who I am has changed. And I want to tell you the truth. I'm an Old Testament professor. I want you to know that the fall of Genesis 3, that the image of God damaged in man through Adam and Eve, New Testament salvation is nothing more than the restitution of that image that allows instantaneous fellowship with God. I enjoyed so much your worship time. Thank God for a vibrant place. We sang about God's presence. Yeah, wonderful. He is with us always. And how do I know that? Because looking back on my life, it's the old poem of the two footprints in the sand, right? I just saw the one. You look back, it's, it's, so, it's so obvious how God has been involved in the decisions and problems and forgiveness of our life. We've just got to face the future with the same kind of confidence that he's with us and for us. And the end of Romans 8, no one can separate us from the love of God, right? Or John 10, no one can pluck us out of his hand. The only person that can pluck you out of God's hand is yourself. If it is true that we are the stewards of a supernatural revelation from the God of creation who wants all people to know him that none should perish but all should come to a knowledge of the truth, 
I'm sure going to be praying for y'all going to, to Gusagapa. I've been there several times uh, preaching the gospel. I want to tell you, God wants to send us out because God's heart beats for a lost world. We've got to be real careful we don't turn inward. We're not, we're not made to turn inward. Fellowship is a byproduct of the Great Commission. May we pray. Lord, forgive us when we say these wonderful things about you but live such seemingly earthly, powerless lives. Please, may the Holy Spirit spark us in such a way that others can see that we're not the same, that there's something different about us since we met you, that our priorities are not those of the world, but of kingdom people, that whatever we do, that we live for the health and growth of the body and not for ourselves, that we're available to whatever you want to do with the gifts and talents and resources that you have given us. We love you, God. Help us love you more. Help us be more available. Help us be more understanding. Give us a heart for your book. Give us a heart for the lost. Give us a heart for one another. Help us. Amen. I'm going to invite my own. I'm going to invite the band, if, uh, if they're still here, I think they are, to come back up. Um, we're going to spend some time in, in worship. We're going to uh, close us out with a time of response. We, uh, this is the part of the service where we respond to the message. And I, I want to say, Bob, thank you. And I also want to say, you're getting us out of here really early. Can you come back during football season <laughs> and preach the 18 weeks of the NFL season? All right, I'll send you a contract. All right, but we're going we're gonna to spend some time responding. So we have communion stations set up around the auditorium, two in the front, two in the back. And uh, we're just going to invite you to respond. Uh, we believe what, what Bob said. We believe the Holy Spirit speaks through God's word. And so you may need to respond to this message. We have Grace Place encouragers in the back. Our elders and their wives will be along the front here. And so um, let's pray. And I'm going to pray over us. And I'm going to ask that we respond to the message today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed. Father God, thank you for your word. God, as we spend time in worship, may your spirit move in our hearts, in our lives. God, as we remember your sacrifice and what you did on that cross, and as we take this time to reflect through the taking of, partaking of communion, God, I pray that you would be glorified in that. Father, I pray over each and every heart that sits in this room this morning. God, that if you've spoken to that heart, that we would respond. God, as we make our elders and as we make our prayer team, as we make men and women available, God, may your people respond. Many of you sitting out in the audience here today, you, you were touched for the very first time. You heard the word gospel. You heard eternal life. You heard Someone say, I met someone I couldn't feel, I couldn't touch, I couldn't see, but my life has never been the same. And there's something stirring in your heart right now. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you, maybe to Christ for the very first time. I want to invite you to be bold and come and grab one of these folks that you see up here. Some of you need prayer. Some of you are like me. You're on a journey. You're trying to figure this thing out. There's a mystery that comes to follow in Christ. And you're struggling. And you just need prayer. You know Jesus, but there's something in you that just needs to reach out to someone and be prayed over. I invite you to come. And then for some of us, you're sold out, man. You are, you're at a place in your journey where everything is clicking. I just ask that you pray for those of us that are not there. And as you take communion, remember the one that we serve.
So, Father, we give this time to you, a time of response, a time of reflection, and a time of communion, a time of prayer, a time of celebration. And we give it to you, Father, and we ask your Holy Spirit to do what only you can do. And so when I say amen in just a minute, we're going to invite you to go, to take communion, to, to, to go and to, to seek someone to, to be prayed over. And then you come back and you come back and we'll close out in worship. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.